All right, Rooster Nation, welcome back. Today I'm talking about manufacturing yourself versus using a co-packer. So last week I did a uh, podcast uh, talking about how production's been a nightmare for me, right? I'm in this new facility. I need uh, 10 to 12 people to make it work. People are no-showing me. And, um, you know, I I just went through that big production run, so I'm back to, uh, you know, high levels of inventory. And to tell you the truth, it went better than I thought. Um, You know, I've been struggling with it a lot, but the truth is I was in my own head. I kind of had a negative attitude about it. Like, oh, man, you know, I hate production. It's such a grind. I always have no-shows, you know, never have enough people. But um, I had a solid team. I got enough people hired in time. They were all good. They worked quickly. We got our all our production goals done. And um, now I'm sitting high on inventory. So moral of the story there is to just uh, have more of a positive, positive attitude, right? Uh, don't get in your own head. And, uh, you know, stay happy, stay healthy, stay positive. And, uh, you know, all things considered, it actually went really well. A lot better than I was expecting. However... On that, uh, on that post, on that podcast episode, Nicole over at Jimix, um, she made a good point because I, I was talking about there how I can't wait to get out of production and get into a co-packer. And she made a great point about co-packers that she knows a lot of people who have had really bad experiences with co-packers, and now they're moving back to self-manufacturing, right? They moved to the co-packer, they took production off their plate, and it was such a disaster They want to go back and start manufacturing themselves. Um, So I wanted to address that a little bit. And the thing is, she's 100% right. Um, A lot of people do have really bad experiences with co-packing. So I kind of wanted to take a minute to talk about why I want to go into a co-packer and some of the things I've heard that aren't really going well. Um, The first thing with co-packing is that a lot of people think it's going to be cheaper than doing it themselves. Um, But it it, of course, it depends on what you're doing. But for a lot of people, it can actually be more expensive because the co-packer now needs to make money as well. You add an extra layer of person who needs to make money. And while your headaches may go down, um, you know, your margins might go down with them. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, Another thing with co-packers is a lot of times the co-packer might be almost perfect for your product, uh, but you need to help, uh, help them buy some piece of equipment that you need specifically. Um, so there's that, right? You may need to drop, you know, who knows how much that equipment is. Could be 20 grand, could be 50 grand, could be 100 grand, could be 200 grand um, for a big specialty piece of equipment. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind. And um, I think what goes wrong with so many people with co-packers stems from the complexity of the product that they're making, right? And that's what's different than is for me is that some people have a very complex product, right? If you're making a unique, like I think of Nicole, her mix is very unique. It's not something, and it's complicated. It requires a lot of love. There's seven different flavors, um, you know, and it requires a very specialty cooking technique that I agree would probably be very difficult for a co-packer to replicate without a lot of work and a lot of babysitting. To, you know, it's not really just a, a cookie cutter product. Um, where I think about my product and that is the reason I want to co-pack is it is so simple, right? It's it's I buy the vegetables pre-cut and frozen. So there's no there's no real work, there's nothing unique going on there, right? Frozen vegetables are commodity. We've already talked about that. So you bring in the vegetables cut and frozen, it's a matter of mixing them in the right proportions, um enrobing them in the appropriate seasoning. Again, that's just running them through an enrobing machine. I would create the seasoning blends and have them made by a third party and ship to the you know, the manufacturer. So that's, that's kind of why I want to go, I want to do co-packing. But if your product is complicated, um, it might not be so simple for you. And I've, I've, I know a couple companies that have gone to co-packing and they've had to go through two or three co-packers because they just don't get the product right. And it might even be the product formulation is good, but the jars aren't sealing and they're leaking or, um, you know, the materials handling isn't right, or they're not sourcing ingredients correctly. So there can be all these things um, that sort of factor into whether or not a co-packer is right for you. And I guess it brings me to the point that there is no right answer of whether or not you should use a co-packer, right? It's very specific. It depends on your product, your business, what you're comfortable with. And, um, you know, there's trade-offs. There's a lot of, you you may have to spend a lot of money up front, as we talked about, with the R&D and the equipment. Um, and it might not work out for you, but on the other hand, 
you know, you may now not have to uh, be in production, which, um, you know, which would be a huge, a huge thing. You know, I think about some of the benefits of co-packing. The reason I, I, the reason I dream of a co-packer is it would really cut my business potentially in half in terms of what I'm worried about, right? If you take production off the table, now you're focused on sales and marketing, right? Those are your big things. And that's what I want to be focused on 100% of the time. When I'm in production, when I'm buying inventory, when I'm updating inventory, when I'm running payroll, I could be working all day on that stuff. And it feels like I've accomplished nothing because it didn't do anything to grow the business. It's working in the business, not on the business, right? We've talked about that. Ingredient sourcing, dealing with the supply and the contracts, um, that could potentially all be taken off your plate with the right co-packer. Now, there's different co-packing models, right? Some co-packers will handle your ingredient sourcing. They will purchase the raw materials, and some won't. Some, you still got to handle all that, all the purchasing, all the logistics, and they just manufacture. So it could take anywhere from a third up to a half of your current business operations off of your plate to focus on sales and marketing. For me, that's huge. Also, for me personally, I just think being in production is an absolute nightmare. I think when you're, when, you know, when you're smaller, it's definitely easier to produce yourself, right? You can be in the commissary kitchen. A lot of the upfront cost has been, um, you know, taken out of the equation for you because the commissary owner bought all the hoods and the stoves and the ovens and this and that. But now when you're in a thousand stores or more and your product's selling really well, we're talking about a totally different operation, right? You need equipment that actually automates, right? Not someone standing there over the stove. You need a warehousing space. You got to store all the product that you make. You need a loading dock to ship it in and out. And my concern with manufacturing yourself is that is so expensive to build out a facility like that, right? You're not going to find a facility that has everything you need that's cookie cutter ready to go. You're going to have to find warehouse space. You're going to have to outfit it with all the production equipment. You're going to need forklifts and a loading dock and moving stuff around. You know, I, I just think about some of the products that have made it big. And they're still self-manufacturing, you know, it, it's hard. I mean, they're still losing money, a lot of them. You know, they got a lot of VC money to build out the manufacturer, the manufacturing facilities. But at the end of the day, it's a whole new element that I just am not ready to take on. For me and my business, um, hallelujah, I cannot wait to get to a co-packer. Another thing that makes it really, really hard for me to try and do manufacturing myself is let's talk about the cold chain, right? Everything needs to stay frozen. So not only do I need to bring in all the manufacturing equipment and the tumblers, I need warehouse space that is refrigerated, that's at zero degrees or below to keep everything cold. We're talking about a multi-million dollar investment to build out a really frozen food manufacturing facility at scale no, thank you, my roosters. Uh, I have no interest in doing that. I am actively looking for a co-packer, and I cannot wait. Um, you know, a couple things that I think I will look for uh, to tread carefully when I'm looking for a co-packer, right? Uh, I think it's going to be kind of like dating. I'm going to need to interview a lot of co-packers to find out who is going to really be my ideal business partner, who wants to grow with me, who has the capabilities to really help me um, and, you know, take me where I want to go. So I think when you're looking for a co-packer, again, I haven't done this yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm always looking and I'm, I've learned a lot as I've been looking and talking to other businesses in the time I've been doing this. I think you got to shop around for the right partner. I think you need to get a really good lawyer and have your product specifications written out. And you need to have recourse if something doesn't go your way because you do not want to get screwed. You don't want to you know, invest all this money in your first production run at a co-packer. Product isn't made to spec. And now they say, oh, you got to eat it. Oh, and by the way, we're going to keep that you know, $150,000 machine that you just bought us. Uh, so I think a good lawyer, a lot of speed dating is what's going to help uh, find a right co-packer. Again, I haven't found a co-packer, but I'm looking. If you know anyone, Rooster Nation, hit me up. Um, I think the last thing that I want to mention um, about the co-packers is it comes with trade-offs, right? I talked about there's no right answer for my business, for your business, for the next. So don't let someone who had a bad experience with a co-packer talk you out of it and, uh, you know, vice versa. Don't think you need one just because you're so anxious to get out of production. You know, your costs might go up to the point where you're making no money. Um, so I think you got to consider the trade-offs of, of a co-packer and what's right for you. But uh, to Nicole's point, a lot of people have had disastrous co-packing relationships. Uh, there's no doubt about it. you got to be very careful 
a lot of people have gone back to self-manufacturing because the co-packer has been such a nightmare. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. All I can say is for me and my product, I cannot wait to get out of production. I absolutely hate production. Um, it takes up a lot of time. It's not really helping me grow the business uh, when I'm in there doing production and all that jazz. So, Rooster Nation, keep that in mind. That's just uh, my thoughts on the co-packer. Uh, where I'm at, no right answer. Like anything in business, especially this business, no one has the answers. Uh, people have ideas, people have advice, but what's right for you and your business and your product is going to be different than every other product that's made it big. So um, that's all I got for you today, Rooster Nation. Good to be back. Good to be out of production for a couple of weeks. We're sitting high on inventory and uh, we'll be in the Rooster studio here uh, making podcasts all week. So looking forward to uh, chatting with you guys and uh, take it easy. I'll catch you next time. See ya.